Sister Florentine and a group of people had gotten together and decided that they would form the White Bear Arts Council. We had no real structure. Uh, Frank Zeller was probably the most structure we had. Uh, but the, the one person that's been around and still is around is Nels Femright. He's been very, very helpful. And I was, of course, involved in the arts. So I thought, this would be a good thing for me. And uh, maybe I could contribute something. A neighbor of mine, Mac Ingham, uh, was involved in the Arts Council. And as soon as he knew I was a painter of sorts, he recruited me. And it didn't take long before I was in too deep to get out. <laughs> there was really no central focus for the arts. There was drama, there was music, there was painting, there was drawing, there was children's, there was writing, and there was really no place where everybody could meet together and be a consist, consist of a community. They would get together and uh, have meetings at houses. There was no office building or anything, and the church, of course, was a place too uh, where we did, but. Uh, Sister Florentine was very, very, particularly in music, she was big in it, and that was her forte, but she believed in all of the arts, and she thought that there's so little of it that people are exposed to. I got to notice that, that we had a community council, which was called the White Bear Arts Council. And I thought, geez, that's really impressive, because here's community that are out of the uh, realm of education, but in the realm of promoting creative things like the arts. And I wanted to be a part of that. Well, like Frank Zeller said, when he moved to White Bear Lake as a teacher, and he heard that the, the community did have an art center, he said immediately that just, uh, just raised his hopes and he thought, that's the kind of community I want to be part of. And of course, he's proved to be sort of our, our, golden, our golden boy. <laughs> in the art world, yes, right. Became their president one year, chaired most of the committees that uh, we represented, and uh, it was a, a great thing that I was with the community and part of that program. I guess I've always been interested in, in doing something. It hasn't always been art, but I was in interested in doing something. And that's, that's what I think the purpose of an art center is to to expose people to those possibilities, and suddenly they say, "God, hmm. they look and they, that that that's exciting." <laughs> um, it was a pretty small group to start out with, but then they really got um, a lot of events going for the visual arts uh, fair in the field, um, you know, and uh, a lot of different. Organizations came forward and supported us, so that was good. So we made money at these shows and had fun, and I did a big mural. I've done murals for these, and that's a lot of work. And so I kind of, before I really got into it, I mean, I had a lot of experience, not getting paid for it, but the experience. The, the group was a kind of a, a tight little group, and we had a lot of fun. It was. It was a wonderful way to start bringing arts to, to White Bear Lake. Polly Shank invited me to a meeting at her home in 1992. Maury Oliphant was the president at the time and he had received a uh, commission. But he said, if I don't have some help, I'm gonna to have to resign. So it was at that point then that Polly and I said, all right, we'll, we'll take over your duties. Well, a couple of years went by and it seemed we were treading water. And then Polly got the idea, why don't we why don't we get on the agenda with the White Bear Council? And 
Explain to them why Art Center would be such a plus. It was uh, one of the ways that we could help at the beginning to make them somewhat more financially viable. It would have been hard to promote some of the programs and, and activities that they had if they had to pay a lot for rent. That's why they didn't have any place before. We said, you can have this rent free. So that's how it, the council really did help us a lot. They sort of threw us a life raft when we needed it. But the big decision, of course, came to, we really did need a part-time or a full-time director for the everyday running of the place. One of the challenges was building the art centers, also learning what the community would desire. So uh, what do they want out of an art center? And so we tried a lot of things to test the waters to see what the community would support. And we found watercolor classes were huge, and, and I believe they still are today. So she, was, she came with lots of enthusiasm, did in fact set up the, the classes, and it seemed we were on the right road. But I had no choice, and the timing was, was probably actually very good um, because um, I think Susie had the skills to bring it to a new level that I wasn't able to. But it was interesting because when uh, we interviewed for the, uh, the next incoming executive director, we actually hired somebody else. And, um, and her resume was like, whew, you know, just off the charts. And Susie's was great too. Uh, Susie had interviewed this other person, I can't remember how many people we interviewed, and, and the, the committee who was, who was uh, making the decision decided to go with this one other person because of her direct experience with uh, community art centers, or I can't remember what her background was, and truthfully, I don't remember her name. And, um, and then I learned within a few months, she almost ran into the ground. <laughs> Well, I came on the board in 2002, and I really was during the time period which was a real transition between Lynn Hagen and Susie Hudson. Um, we had a new executive director who'd been there just a couple of months, and we were starting a strategic planning process when I joined the board. But I was asked to be treasurer, and as I started reviewing the financial situation, I found out that we were in trouble, and that we were not... Uh, we did not have enough funds really to meet payroll. We made the very tough decision of um, eliminating the position of executive director. We stayed alive for a year and at the end of the first year then of the board uh, running things, I was treasurer and chair at the same time, which probably is not the best thing to do. Uh, we realized that we could probably be, uh, hire an office assistant and at that point um, we hired Danielle. I was the education coordinator's assistant. I first started um, eight hours a week and I'd just come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays and answer the phone and then I graduated to education coordinator. So Danielle precedes Susie by about two months. I was hired as an events manager for the first six months with the understanding then that, you know, if, if things worked out um, and the budget allowed, that they were looking for an executive director and that they would hopefully be able to um, provide that position. Susie did not start on full time, but as it grew, um, you had to. And I think really one of our defining moments was when we did um, Open Canvas the very first year. And it was a success, but it was so much work. I mean, it was so time intensive. To the outside public, it looked like just a fantastic event, but there were so many hours put in to do it. And we had money that we had made and Kelly Ludekin came from, um, he, was, he was a iron pour guy and said, would you want to do an iron pour? And we had no idea what that was. And Susie, to her credit, took a, a leap of faith on that and spent this hard, some of our hard earned money on this event. We went to a fundraiser and they were doing an iron pouring out in the alley. And so we were just, aghast because we'd never seen anything like it and they had melted down old radiators to get the liquid to be pouring and it was just fascinating and very exciting and that there was a 
a band and they were playing on garbage cans and people were wearing silver fireman suits and um, I, I mean it was really quite a uh, production. The Iron Pour was a little bit of a game changer for the Art Center in terms of um, it had high visibility, it was a dramatic event, it was a ton of fun. That became like art for everybody. I mean, it was a guy art. It was, you know, <laughs> an amazing thing to watch. And I, I think that was a defining moment for the Art Center in my mind. So here's what we're going to do today. Along with many other things in the 90s, art had, had been a, a casualty of the budget challenges. And then, then Frank showed me the work that he had done on, on curriculum. It was, there were watercolors, three lessons per grade, kindergarten through fifth grade. And I knew enough about art from my experience working with the curriculum in Minnetonka to know that these, these were very good lessons, really lessons that would inspire children, they would really enjoy. So each kid gets five art lessons a year from a professional artist. And, uh, you know, it's, it's three watercolor, couple of drawing lessons, but I teach lessons, okay? So I teach, you know, how to paint, how to draw, different techniques, different things. Uh, it's not basically project oriented. So there's, at the end result is, is, oh, how do I gesture draw, or how did we draw portraits and stuff? You know, so they're comfortable doing art. And we, we received some attention we weren't expecting in 2010, so that's after, after a couple of years uh, with a partnership. University of Minnesota Humphrey Institute recognized us with one of their innovation awards. Do it like that. Yeah, so you can hang it on the wall. It's the outreach that the Art Center provides that is just magical. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, the community, the, the school district, the surrounding areas, it's outside of these walls that really touches. In the last 50 years, how the Art Center has just spread, you know, from just these buildings that we've been in, and now we're out. And, and it's building even more. It's growing even more. Shapes, lines, and colors. That's what we use it to make our artwork. You know what, it was always in our head, and I think always the dream was that maybe we'd be able to have the whole armory space, but it, it wasn't gonna happen, and if it did, it needed so much work. But um, if I can just refer to Polly Shank, who you know just told me we've got to get this space, and she had an engineer we needed to contact, and all of this stuff, but we knew we needed space, and we had outgrown where we were, and to grow, it had to happen. Susie said, Bob, would you go and have a look, see what you can find, you know. So then we started, created a small committee, four people, five people, I think, and kept looking and looking and looking. Couldn't find anything around here, but there was a lot of open spaces on there. But we established a criteria of what we wanted to do, what kind of building we wanted, and so then uh, eventually uh, we came across this building here, which was kind of ragged, tucked away. I remember a dark night. We were all assembled out in the side of this building and it had been raining. So of course, when we got inside the building, it was leaking. And we thought, well, this is a lot of space. And everyone kind of thought, yeah, it's kind of dark and gloomy and kind of clammy. But it had the possibility of being in a location that might work. And the price tag was very appropriate because it was in foreclosure. And right towards the end, we interviewed Peter Kramer, who was a well-known architect for nonprofits and everything else on there. So he comes in, very discreet, very, very quiet, sits down, and we said, well, what have you got? He said, well, I have a piece of paper. I said, what would you like in your building? So he was the first person that said what we would like and not what they would like to do. 
And I was struck right from the whole process that the people on the board at that time, and Susie, these were, these were folks who had been champions of this program and were, were, everybody was going in the same direction. We didn't start construction on the building till we had about 80% of the funds in hand. We paid cash for the property, so we had all of the funds in place before we bought the property. Um, and then you know, we, we were able to pay off the mortgage within three years of the, the construction. I think back of uh, when we first started on this project for the new building, um, thinking, wow, how are we going to raise that much money? But then we just started going on and, and meeting with different people, and it, it spoke for itself. Uh, White Bear Center for the Arts raised its own money on its own merits. I love the building. We, we kept it as simple as we possibly could because we wanted the, the art to be the focus of what happened here. And when I say the art, I mean the people who are doing it. So the focus here is this kind of welcoming um, gathering place where people do art. And uh, it's magical. This is the place, this place is vibrant, it's full of energy. Um, Susie is a visionary and is uh, wonderful as far as uh, building relationships with individuals. She's got such a great passion for this place that it is contagious. I mean, you can't help but be passionate about it too. You can't help but want to contribute or want to participate in a class or, because she's just so enthusiastic about it. Susie brought uh, all the good stuff about life into the art center and it made it more fun for people and educational and um, I think about Scotty Hartzell um, when when he used to come it, it just was his home and um, he really excelled I mean he not only what did turn into a fairly good artist but uh, you know built his confidence and um, uh, people like Scotty and he liked the art center and this was back when it was over at the Armory. And Scott used to love, and he, he just really enjoyed hanging out with uh, everybody. And then I, I can't say enough about Susie uh, Hudson, who also uh, took Scott under her wing and just uh, uh, mentored him and uh, got him going. And more so than anything, he really joy, enjoyed the camaraderie of uh, being uh, uh, hanging out at the Art Center. Well, I think Susie is the personification of the love this community has for the arts. And she's out there, out front. When we got to know her, she had the very bright pink hair. And she was engaged with everyone, sharing her enthusiasm for art. And this whole transition into this building and seeing it come alive and be what it is today, all under her management. She guided it. She encouraged more people to get involved. She rode through dark times and bright times. And she has, I think, managed that hospitality that I was talking about. She's a natural embrace to the people who walk through the door. And when all the people who work here see her in engaging with people, they too follow her lead. So it's a wonderful, warm, emotional greeting that goes to everybody. And I think you have to realize that what Susie has done here is unique. It is extremely difficult. Uh, I ran a lot of businesses around the world and it's very difficult for someone to go from a small organization in the armory uh, to stepping over, building a building, hiring new staff, expanding a program, and living through 
that that's a real transition uh, and a very difficult one. And most people can't do it. Uh, and they usually burn out about six months into the transition. And I have to give Susie credit. She, she did it, she did it very successfully. And I believe you look around, this has been a very successful venture. So she did a good job of building that team and um, her vision as an artist herself and as a fighter. With her health, she had to fight. Uh, she was perfect to, to pull this together. The story of the pink hair really began as a personal expression. Um, I, I was a breast can I am a breast cancer survivor, and um, in October, one of the first years after my hair came back, um, my mom and I got a hold of some pink hair dye, and we each did a little pink in our hair for an event we were going to, and. Little by little, that little pink got more and bolder, and and as my job here, it, it kind of got connected to the art center. I got identified as the lady with the pink hair. She works at the art center. Yeah, it just so it was it was more a personal um, expression of joy too. She was, she was noticed and we needed to be noticed at that time. The art center needed to be noticed and you know, Susie would probably say it's not about noticing Susie, but, but it was because Susie was the, the leadership and at the helm of uh, the growth that was happening and she wore it well. <laughs> the board of directors did vote on my pink hair uh, as we embarked on the capital campaign. I was a little concerned, you know, if, if you think that the pink is going to be a turnoff for some of the big foundations or, you know, people that we might have to talk to, I'm, um, um, you know, happy to, to go back to a more normal look. And the four was, no, you must keep your pink hair. <laughs> like, okay, that's the first time I think it's been voted on, but... <laughs> It seems endless to me where we can go. I think now that we have this, I think it's, people know we're here, you know, and, and the work of telling our story, it gets easier and easier. Um, you know, the story's happening every minute in this building and people see it. Well, we have very generous people here who have contributed and we have artistic people and we have some good leaders. And they all kind of converged at the right time and place and the stars lined up and, um, and it worked. So all in all, it's a fantastic combination of uh, building, events, people, staff, and, and, and continued enthusiasm for it by both our donors and our members here and there. So really have to thank them. It's all about community, and um, you have people that want to participate and give. And, um, and that's true of you know, just so many people too numerous to name, but uh, I think of the Ford family and Polly Shank and just all these people that really uh, not are just writing a check. They really care about the place and they participate. And that, that's the community. So uh, it makes our community a richer place. Because what we feel strongly about is investing in the future of the community. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to help an organization such as this that reaches out to so many people and so many young people uh, to give them the opportunity to grow in this type of environment. I mean, that's a fantastic way to give back, if you will, uh, because the returns are so rich. Everyone is welcome and everyone's welcome to be creative in their own way. 
and then also celebrating uh, artists that we wouldn't normally be able to come into contact with, uh, short of you know having to travel somewhere else. That's quite remarkable. I think people come in here a little bit scared to express themselves or to even find out what that means. And I think they and I have found a comfort here and a freedom and courage and a little bit more of themselves. We are here to make sure that everybody understands there is some way that if you are a breathing human being, you can participate in the arts. It's so exciting because it's bringing people together in the area of the arts. And there are no boundaries when you're talking about the arts. Everybody can flow back and forth and have their own ideas and their own interests and share them equally. I say that you walk into this building and, and it has a heart. I mean, it has a heart and it has a beat to it. And um, the Armory did too, but the people that, that I've met are people that I, I maybe never would have crossed paths with. And it's become my, my circle. And I'll, I'll quote Mary Gove where she said, I finally have found my people. And that's what it feels like. And I think people that walk through these doors have a sense of, of belonging. Um, it doesn't feel exclusive. Um, it, it feels like you're here and you you belong here. Well, I started on the ground running with the, um, connecting with all the clients and talking them into taking classes and then working with the teachers and then expanding uh, the teaching staff and, you know, working it all out with everybody. And, and I feel just a deep connection with all the people that have been here in the last 15 years and the and the teachers that have made it happen and pe people have been so dedicated it's not not only the teachers that I've been working with but the students that have stayed with people Frank has one student that has been with him for 50 years over 50 years and, and just think of that the people that come here week after week some people take two classes a week sometimes three classes a week and you know, I just want to thank those people whose love of this place has, has made it happen. This art center, of course, is going to be around for another 50 or 100 years. You know, I won't be. Frank will still be here. <laughs> Frank will still be here teaching. There's no doubt about that.